today we'll be painting first and inking later. Our reference is a landscape, specifically a rock formation and a Joshua tree. I like to sketch with water first, then lay down the paint and spread it, because depending on the paint brand, you might get random bursts of color that'll leave a textured look on your paper. If that's not what you're going for, then add color to your brush and start sketching as if it were a pencil. Okay, let's talk a little bit about where our subject is located, along with a couple of interesting stories. Joshua Tree National Park became an official park on October 31st, 1994, thanks to the California Desert Protection Act. It's an 800,000 acre desert paradise. If you like deserts, for me, it depends on the time of the year. Anyways, it's 800,000 acres and that's a lot. By comparison, the state of Rhode Island is a tad less than 670,000 acres. I didn't know this, but Joshua Tree is made up of two deserts, the Mojave and the Colorado. Colorado Desert. The eastern part of Joshua Tree extends to the western boundary of the Colorado Desert. Not Colorado State because it's all in California. The term Colorado refers to the Colorado River flowing through the area. Going a bit on a tangent right now, the Colorado Desert is part of the Sonoran Desert which spans across several states. All right, so the park resides in two deserts. It's like the dynamic duo or yin and yang of national parks. And it's all because of elevation. On the park's eastern side, the Colorado desert half is considered the quote unquote low desert because it hangs out below 3,000 feet. The landscape is more rugged, decorated with creosote bushes and occasional bursts of flowering ocotillo and chala cactus. Now, shifting to the western half, you'll find yourself in the Mojave Desert. This is the quote-unquote high desert, standing above 3,000 feet. In this area, you'll see sandy plains, and it will showcase the tall Joshua trees, also known as yucca brevi brevifolia, or basically just yuccas. And these yucca plants are among large granite rocks, which we are drawing today. It is a picturesque scene, distinctly different from the nearby eastern desert. Millions of visitors discover this surprising and sudden change between these two desert ecosystems each year. The Colorado's dry and arid land gives way to the Mojave's sandy plains and remarkable geological formations, making this national park a unique and diverse desert experience. I had zero clue that this park was that big, let alone two ecosystems or, or deserts going on. I'm definitely going to plan a trip soon and hopefully get some real life sketches I can share with you all. Okay, now for the interesting stories. The first one is the Wall Street Mill. Before Joshua Tree National Park became a popular hiking spot, it was home to miners seeking gold. Today, you could still find remnants of their mills and homesteads like the Wall Street Mill and Wonderland Ranch. These two sites are connected by a walking trail, and it basically stands as a reminder of the park's early pioneers and history. The Wall Street Mill was built by a miner named William Keyes, aka Bill. This mill was built to crush ore to reveal silver and gold in that area. The mill's efficiency, however, created conflict with his neighbor, Worth Bagley. This conflict led to a huge disagreement, causing Bill to shoot and kill Worth. Now, Bill didn't feel bad about this. So much so, he decided to commemorate this event by erecting a small monument with the words, I'm quoting this, here is where Worth Bagley bit the dust at the hand of W.F. Keys, May 11, 1943. Crazy, right? This memorial, which kind of tells you about the rugged tales of the wild, wild west, faced vandalism over time, so the park service had to remove it. Today, there's just a simple sign quietly marking the site. So legend has it, if you ever visit the Wall Street Mill hiking trail, just be on the lookout for mysterious shadows or weird lights. Some hikers say they felt a bit spooked, like they were being watched. There are even stories about whispers and footsteps in the empty mill. Okay, so let's fast forward a bit into history and talk about the Joshua Tree Inn. When people think of ghosts there, one name pops up, Graham Parsons, the country rock star. 
In the fall of 1973, he passed away in room 8 of the Joshua Tree Inn, a little motel in the middle of nowhere by the highway. This was a real heartbreaker for the music world. Now, ever since Graham left the physical world, people say the inn's got some serious, ghostly, creepy vibes. But get this, it's not just Graham's ghost. They say there are other eerie things going on in other rooms. So if you're into this type of experience, then I'm sure you won't miss out on the scary vibes if you don't necessarily stay in room eight. But on a quick note, even before Graham passed away, this inn was supposedly the go-to spot for celebrities and musicians. This was their oasis when they wanted to get away from the craziness of Hollywood or the music scene. The summer of 1973, Graham's home in Topanga Canyon burned down, and he lost pretty much everything. All he had left was his guitar and car. After the fire, he stayed with his manager, Phil Kaufman, and they had plans for another tour in October. But in need of a break, Graham headed to Joshua Tree to relax, let loose, and just get it together before his tour. He was joined by his girlfriend, Margaret Fisher, his manager, Phil Kaufman, and Phil's girlfriend, Dale McElroy. One night, they partied hard. There were a lot of drugs and drinking, and unfortunately, on September 19th, 1973, at 12.15 a.m., Graham was pronounced dead at the Yucca Valley Hospital from a morphine and alcohol overdose. Now, here's the twist. After Parsons died, the original plan was to take his body to Louisiana to be with his family. However, things took an unexpected turn. Phil Kaufman, his manager, and a roadie dressed up as funeral homeworkers, drove to Los Angeles International Airport in a hearse and managed to intercept Parsons' body before it could be loaded onto the plane. It turned out that Parsons and Kaufman had a secret agreement that went against traditional funeral practices. If any anything happened to Parsons, he wanted his ashes to be scattered in the Joshua Tree National Park, a place he loved and found peace during vacations. So in a disguised hearse adventure at LAX, an unconventional farewell journey started, driven by the unique promise between a departed musician and his loyal manager. They say spirits usually go back to places they love or felt comfort in, not necessarily where they died. In Graham Parsons' case, it's both. It seems like he's still hanging out around the Joshua Tree Inn, a spot he loved and where he passed away. Okay, y'all, this is where I'm going to end this today and finish up my sketch with some lovely, relaxing music. Hope you had a chance to sketch with me and enjoy the history and ghost stories of the amazing and beautiful Joshua Tree National Park. Until the next video, stay positive, stay creative, and be kind. Thank you.